the war to end all wars, part two. Everybody wasn't for the war. Yes, for the most part, the general public was. The people like the IWW, the International Workers of the World, the Socialist Party, and the First Lady in Congress, Jeanette Rankin, Charles Lindbergh, who we call Lucky Lindy, and they're just to name a few. Uh, so I can say, for the most part, the general public was for it. And the CPI, the Committee for Public Information, toured the nation with pro-war propaganda. The German Kaiser and all Germans were anti theses of freedom. They were nothing but bloodthirsty Huns. And of course, the language of democracy and freedom were always used, usually with a symbol of the Statue of Liberty or American flag. And the use of this language of freedom and liberty caused a demand for expansions of it at home. And while at first President Wilson seemed to endorse women's suffrage, this new generation of the women activists, I mean, oh man, they were just something else. They wore britches, they, they believed in civil disobedience, they, they marched in demonstrations in front of the White House, they were pushing for a prohibition, and then he began to lose his support. And also there was a push to Americanize all the immigrants. At the same time, Congress passed the 18th Amendment prohibiting the manufacture, distribution, and sale of alcohol, but it took three years for it to be passed or ratified by all the states. But the war initiated the most extreme repression of civil liberties in American history. Now, I cannot fault the government for wanting to protect her citizens, but our country, as others do also, uh, has this desire that if there's an, any kind of a threat or possible danger to our country, the government goes all out to protect our citizens. And I agree with this to a point, but then they start making laws and they go overboard. And, and to use a perfect example, we've got the uh, Patriot Act still in effect right now because of 9-11. And back then, <laughs> a very extreme repression was implemented by the state governments and, and even private groups. And a lot of states, <laughs> They began to imprison anyone who was critical of her flag. They outlawed the possession of a flag that was red or black because to them that symbolized communism or anarchism. And 23 different states passed laws making it criminal and illegal to advocate political change through an unlawful act or a change in industrial ownership. And patriotism came to be synonymous with the support for the government, the war, the American economic system, and while anti-war sentiment, labor radicalism, and sympathy for the Russian Revolution became un-American. And local authorities investigated residents who did not buy liberty bonds. Schools revised their curriculum to ensure its patriotism, and they required all the teachers to sign loyalty oaths. The 250,000 members of something called the American Protective League helped the Justice Department identify radicals and critics of the war by spying on their neighbors and carrying out what they call slacker raids. And they stopped thousands of men in major cities and required them to produce their draft card. And of course, private groups used the war as an opportunity to attack their neighbors, as was the case with the industrial workers of the world, whose members were attacked, some killed, and whose leadership was arrested. And even though some progressives protested individual incidents, most progressives did not challenge the general atmosphere of repression. Now, what was called the race problem was a major subject of debate before the war. And it referred to more than just relations between black and whites. In 1911, the United States Immigration Commission listed in one of its publications 45 different races, each with its own alleged innate characteristics, ranging from Anglo-Saxons, of course, at the top of the racial hierarchy, down to Hebrews and Northern Italians, and at the very bottom, the Southern Italians. Who was apparently most violent and undisciplined and were incapable of assimilation. And popular writers asserted that the wave of new immigration and our white women's decline in the birth rate was threatening the American civilization. And this new science of eugenics, which is a study of alleged mental traits of different races, it began to lend scientific legitimacy to this new nativism. The nationalization of politics and the economy seemed to elevate consciousness of ethnic and racial differences and called to call for an Americanization, the creation of a more homogeneous natural culture. And in 1908, a play called The Melting Pot 
gave it name to the process by which immigrants were expected to merge their identity with American nationality. And public and private leaders, including teachers, union officials, social reformers, and even public officials, all began to engage in this Americanization effort. This is a picture of an Americanization celebration. And I think most of these are Americans, but they've been you know, taught how to recite the Pledge of Allegiance, etc. Now, the Ford Motor Company famously created a sociological, social, sociological department that caused them to enter, and I mean enter, just go into the immigrant workers' homes to examine their clothes and their furniture and their food, and then enroll them in an English language course. And if you didn't decide to become Americanized, you'd lose your job. A few progressives criticized the Americanization and demanded that Americans respect immigrant cultures. Reformers at Hull House began to encourage immigrants to value their European backgrounds, but these were few and far between. The Americanization efforts took on a new urgency and became more extreme during World War I, and it especially affected German Americans, who numbered 9 million by 1914. And before the war, Americans admired the German culture, which included its music, its literature, and philosophy. But when we declared war, the German language and German culture became a target of pro-war organizations. German English was, was banned from schools, you could no longer teach it. German music was not allowed to be played, and German terms became very Americanized, as an example in the text is hamburger became Liberty Sandwich. And by 1920, German culture had been stigmatized and had received receded totally from its previous place of prominence and respect. <clears throat> graduates of the Ford English School. But even while Americanization efforts sought to assimilate the immigrants, and it was successful at the Ford plant, the war reinforced the idea that certain kinds of undesirables ought to be excluded from the country. Some argued that the new immigrants appreciated democracy less than Anglo-Saxons, and as they seemed more likely to embrace radical doctrines like socialism and anarchism, while others argued that immigrants and blacks lower scores on the intelligent quotient the IQ, which had just been invented in 1916, and it was invented for examining army recruits. It required restrictions. In 1917, Congress passed over Wilson's veto, a requirement that literate immigrants be literate in English or at least one other language. Ten years later, the Supreme Court upheld laws authorizing doctors to sterilize the mentally ill to prevent them from reproducing. And I'm going to repeat that. In 1927, the Supreme Court upheld laws authorizing doctors to sterilize the mentally ill to prevent them from reproducing. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said, quote, three generations of imbeciles are enough, unquote. Now, Americanization assumed that European immigrants, and especially their children, could eventually adjust to American life and adopt our ideas and become citizens who enjoyed our freedoms. But this assumption did not apply to non-white immigrants or the blacks who faced persistent exclusion. But the wartime labor demands increased and allowed the immigration of Mexicans, who had been exempted. And they were exempted from 1979 by the literacy rules. But though Mexicans, Mexicans were legally considered white, yeah, state and local officials in the Southwest discriminated against them. And the system of segregation that you could really right directly to the Jim Crow laws in the South. They had separate hospitals and separate schools and theaters. They were separate, segregated totally. And although Puerto Ricans were conferred citizenship by Congress on the eve of World War I, and Puerto Rican men became subject to the draft and served in the war, they were still not allowed to vote for the president or have representation in Congress. Now, most of these restrictions were policies toward Asian Americans. In 1907, Roosevelt negotiated a, quote, gentleman's agreement, unquote, in which Japan agreed to end any further Japanese migration, except for the wives and children of men who were already in our country. And in 1913, California banned all aliens incapable of becoming naturalized system, citizens, i.e. Asians, from owning or leasing land. African Americans members of the largest non-white group in America were excluded from almost all progressive ideas of freedom. They were disenfranchised in the South, barred from most unions and skilled jobs, and most black women worked outside their home for very low wages, and most other blacks were desperately poor. 
they could not participate in any consumer society. They didn't have the money to participate. They didn't really usually have enough money to even pay their rent. And nearly all progressive intellectuals, social scientists, labor reformers, and suffrage advocates were totally unconcerned about the conditions for our black Americans. Meanwhile, the progressive presidents had shared dominant racial attitudes regarding blacks. Theodore Roosevelt himself, celebration of Anglo-Saxon supremacy led him to call Indians savages and state that blacks were unfit to exercise the vote. Not even Jane Addams, who was one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, resisted the abandonment of the civil rights plank in the 1912 progressive platform. Woodrow Wilson, a native from Virginia, celebrated the South's genuine representation of government. He imposed racial segregation on federal agencies in Washington, D.C. He fired black federal employees. And at the White House, I've got the word screen, and that simply means he showed the premiere of the movie The Birth of a Nation, a very, very racist film, glorifying the Ku Klux Klan as having defended white civilization and womanhood during Reconstruction. If you ever get a chance to view that film, yes, it is a silent film. And I always show it in my black history class. It, it starts out, you kind of laugh at you know, the exaggerated body movements of the people acting, but it doesn't take you maybe 10 minutes into it, and you are really into this movie. And it, it makes, you mad, makes you mad, it makes you totally angry. Enter W.E.B. Du Bois. Yes, he was one of the founders of the NAACP and the editor of its magazine, The Crisis. He was invited to join this group of whites because he was a very educated and prominent African American in the North. Mr. Du Bois, or I should say Dr. Du Bois, uh, he wanted to do everything he could for his people, but unfortunately he didn't have his finger on the pulse. He was born in the North to a middle class family. He was born free. He had been to school in this country to Harvard. He'd even gone over to England and got some certain uh, degrees. I mean, the man was extremely educated, a ferocious writer, and we even use some of his textbooks still in sociology classes. He was pushing for racial equality. But during this time, other black leaders were trying to renew America's Reconstruction era commitment to racial equality. And no other leader did more to try to renew this movement than scholar and activist W.E.B. Du Bois. He was born in Massachusetts, a free man, Harvard graduate. He wrote a book, The Souls of Black Folks, in 1903, and he called on blacks to reject the accommodations of Booker T. Washington. <clears throat> you see, Mr. Du Bois, excuse me, Dr. Du Bois, not trying to be disrespectful, he believed that the black people should have all the right, rights and equalities of the white man, and now, no studying around, do it right now. Whereas Booker T., he had his finger on the pulse of the whites in the South and the North, and he knew that the white people were not going to stand for this. His idea of accommodation, which is accommodationism, I don't think it's actually a legitimate word, but it's what he meant, you know, uh, accommodate the white man, prove to him you can be trusted, show him that you, got to, you don't have to be afraid of me, and it will come. In other words, back off, slow down, it will come later. So Du Bois wanted equality now, Washington says later. He and Booker T. Were, Booker T. and uh, Du Bois were at each other's throats the entire time. And Du Bois believed that the talented, educated African Americans like himself were a talented ten who could use their education and talent to fight inequality. In 1905, the Du Bois gathered the black leaders at Niagara Falls in Canada and launched what he called the Niagara Movement which demanded the restoration of black rights to vote, an end to segregation, and complete equality in economic and educational opportunities. Sounds good. They also demanded uh, that they had racial justice for the rest of the 20th century. In 1909, Du Bois joined with the mostly white reformers to organize the NAACP, and he was invited to be the pardon expression token black at the meeting, and they made him the editor of their newly created magazine, The Crisis. Oh man, that was their biggest mistake, because he took it and he used it as a bully pulpit, and he did more good for the black people by letting them know what was going on through this magazine than anything else. He also launched a, a series of articles in there on why the 14 to 15 minutes were not being ratified, and why they were not being enforced. We have some states that didn't ratify them until the middle of the 20th century. 
among black Americans wartime talk of freedom had really sparked hope for radical changes in the race problems back home. And most black leaders saw the American participation in the war as an opportunity to win freedom for blacks at home. The boy himself called on African Americans to close the ranks and enlist in the army, believing that the black sacrifice would earn them the rights upon returning to their home country. Of course, this did not happen, as the Navy barred blacks entirely and the segregated army assigned most of the 400,000 black soldiers who served to supply units rather than combat. But it didn't mention this in your textbook, and I'm going to tell you. The first combat group to arrive in Europe were blacks from our own local community, Spartanburg, South Carolina. You see, we had most of the training camps for blacks and whites was in the South because of closeness to water and it was warm, so they had to worry about a lot of things. And this is, for years, this has been true. Your most of your training camps for the military are in the South. So they were sending the black people who had enlisted to the South to train. Of course, this did not make the people of the South very happy, especially the people of Spartanburg, South Carolina. And they did everything they could to get the government to move them out. Well, they were being in the process of being trained. They hadn't been totally trained. At this point in time, every regiment in the military had their own band. And one day, a member of the uh, Black Units Band was in Spartanburg, went to a hotel to buy a newspaper. And when he walked in, the proprietor knocked the man's hat off. And when he bent over to pick up his hat, he kicked him in the rear and kicked him out of the hotel. Well, of course, this was not only disrespectful, it was illegal, it was totally out of line. And when he got back to the base, he told his buddies about it. They were going to go to town and tear up Spartanburg. Well, their leaders found out about it. They even sent people down from Washington to try to quell this down because there was enough black people on the base. They could have destroyed the town and it would have been a riot to end all riots. So they didn't want anything to happen. And they talked to them and they realized, you know, you've got to play it calm because whatever you do is going to reflect on other black troops too. So they had really basically three choices. They could just hope that the black men stayed calm and keep them confined to base and continue their training. They could do what the people of Spartanburg wanted and move the entire group somewhere else. Or they could curtail their training and send them overseas. And that's what they did. They curtailed their training and they sent them to France and assigned them to a French unit who was really horrified that the men were not trained for war. So they proceeded to teach the men how to shoot guns, how to throw grenades, and were surprised that no matter what they assigned these men, they did it and did it very, very well. So this is not in your text, and I, of course, will not ask you a question on it. I just wanted you to know that our little town of Spartanburg, well, back when I was going to high school, I went to high school in Greenville, South Carolina, and uh, Spartanburg and Greenville were big rivals. And it broke my heart that one of my best friends lived in Spartanburg, but that's a different story. Anyway, the Army is segregated, the Navy is barring blacks, the Marines are barring blacks as well as the Navy. But there were some social changes that transformed American race relations. Few, but this involved work, employment. Because the increased war production and the sharp decline in the European immigration and the thousands of white men leaving for jobs in the military, it made available thousands of industrial jobs to blacks for the first time. And it kind of inspired a mass migration from the South to the North. And when the war began, 90% of American blacks lived in the South, and most northern cities had very small populations of blacks. But between 1910 and 1920, more than half a million blacks left the South, moving to the large cities like New York and Chicago, and even the smaller ones like Akron and Buffalo and Trenton and Cleveland, where the uh, industrial jobs for the war were. And the desire for work and higher wages and education and escape from the threat of violence in the South and having to be able to vote it motivated many an African American, both black and white, to move. Yet these migrants encountered considerable disappointments, including limited employment, exclusion from unions, housing segregation, and outbreaks of violence. Dozens of blacks were killed in a 1917 riot in East St. Louis, where blacks had been recruited to weaken the unions. In 1919, more than 250 people died in riots in northern cities, most notably in Chicago. But racial violence also exploded in the South, where in the year after the war, dozens were lynched, including black veterans who made the mistake of wearing their uniforms proudly back to their southern towns. And any black sharecropper that went on strike, they were all massacred by white vigilantes. 
with the worst race riot in American history occurred in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921, where more than 300 blacks were killed and thousands made homeless by a white mob, which included police and National Guard. After black veterans tried to prevent the lynching of a youth who had accidentally tripped and fallen on a white female elevator operator, sparking rumors of rape. Now, Dr. Carol Anderson, I use her uh, lecture. She's an excellent lecturer. I wish I could close enough to take the class from her myself. She uh, works at Emory University and she's a professor of black studies. And she's going to tell you a little bit more about this race riot in Tulsa. I think you'll enjoy listening to her. Whoops, what happened? Come on. Oops. There we go. This program is brought to you by Emory University. This program is brought to you by Emory University. I want to make sure you know where it's coming from. Tulsa, the Af African American community in Tulsa, was Tulsa, relatively the prosperous, well educated. I mean, they had done everything that they were supposed well to do in terms of the American dream. They had done everything that they were supposed to do in terms of the American dream. You go to school, you, buy, you work hard, you save your money, you go to school, you buy property. Let's try this again. I must have clicked twice. My apologies, but I don't want to start over. This program is brought to you by Emory University. Tulsa, the Af African American community in Tulsa, was relatively prosperous, well educated. I mean, they had done everything that they were supposed to do in terms of the American dream. You work hard, you save your money, you go to school, you buy property. I mean, this is, and this is what they had done under horrific conditions. I mean, when you look at the context of what black, black uh, America looked like at the time, the fact that they were able to do this, this is one of the things that we herald in terms of when we talk about the immigrant story, right? But instead, this created such seething resentment in Tulsa that you had black doctors, black attorneys, black businessmen. I mean, in fact, this area of Tulsa was known as Black Wall Street to give you some sense of how much it held in terms of value, in terms of esteem, in terms of, of worth. And, but that resentment in Tulsa was so intense and that it was just waiting for a, a, a spark to just ignite it. That spark was a black messenger was delivering a message, you know, they had messengers back in the day, was delivering a message downtown. And he gets in the elevator and there's a white woman in the elevator. I believe she was the elevator operator. And from the first floor through the third floor, I mean, the elevator may have bumped or something, and he, 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 he hit her a little bit, but he didn't hit her. He just kind of brushed her against it. She yelled, rape. Now, to understand what the charge of rape means when a white woman yells rape against a black man in this period, because part of understanding the violence that African Americans faced was to deal with the issue of what was called the sanctity of white womanhood. And that sanctity of white womanhood said that all white women had to be protected from black beast, so-called black beast. And when she yelled rape, now the charge was absolutely improbable from the first floor through the, to the third floor. Improbable. But it was the spark. They couldn't wait because he was the son of a prominent black businessman. So they hauled him, the police hauled him down to the station. Well, the black elite came down to the station going, you know, th this is my son, this is my boy. Uh-uh, uh-uh, my son wouldn't do this. What's his bail? You know, and I'm like, oh, uppity, how, how dare you come down here? How dare you? And because the African-American community sensed that the, the sense of anger and violence was rising, it wasn't one or two that came down, there were several of them that came down. I'm like, oh, so what, are you going to storm the, the jail? They said, no, but we're here for justice. We're here for justice. And then the lynch mob began to form in Tulsa. It was like, oh, these are some uppity Negroes who need to be put back in their place. And the violence began. 
black Tulsa was, the lynch mob rode in, but they also came in airplanes, dropping bombs on Tulsa, black Tulsa. There are de descriptions and depictions of African Americans being decapitated, being forced to kneel down and just having their heads severed. There are the pictures of the strafings, of the bombings, of the shootings. Nobody's quite sure what the death toll is. But when you look at the pictures, what you see is an area that had once been thriving. What we say is the American dream, absolutely leveled by the violence, by the lynch mobs, by the airplanes, by the bombs, leveled. Black Tulsa has never recovered. As the bombings are happening, as the violence is happening, as Tulsa is on fire, the governor of Oklahoma is like, whoa, maybe, mmm, I probably should. The feds are looking up going, this is not our issue. I bet you stopped. Wow. Psst. Nothing we can do here. And that is so indicative of the imbalance that has happened in terms of justice, in terms of rights, in terms of the protection of basic civil and human rights for African Americans in the United States. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University. She is something else, isn't she? We will meet her again when we come across uh, some more lynchings in the 20s, in the 1920s. I would love to be able to get past from this lady. She is, has a really unique way of lecturing, as well as being extremely knowledgeable and the tragedy, and just something about this lady, I really admire her. But, getting on with the lesson, African Americans were inspired with a new sense of militancy after all the, the war and all the violence that were going on. They decided to fight back, and this is going to cause some problems with the white folks. In northern cities, a lot of blacks began to support the Universal Negro Improvement Association, a movement <laughs> I wish we had more time to spend on him. Uh, Marcus Garvey is quite a dude. Uh, National Universal Negro Improvement Association. On paper, it, it's kind of like sharecropping. It looks so good on paper. But unfortunately, Mr. Garvey knew how to tap into the feelings and the fears of the African race. Now, he was a recent immigrant from Jamaica. Let me tell you a little bit about him. The picture on the left is what he looked like in real life. The picture on the right is what he portrayed himself as, the potentate of Africa. And he'd drive around in his open car, and uh, he, was, he was some part of a joke. I said he was an immigrant from Jamaica, born in 1887, and he loved to read. And at 14, he left school and left, went to go to another island and became a printer's apprentice. And there, he learned about discrimination, and he led strikes for higher wages, but he was <laughs> asked to leave. So he traveled to South and Central America. In 1914, he returned to Jamaica and founded the United Negro Industrial Association. Improvement, I'm sorry. In 1916, two years later, he moved to Europe and he urged African Americans to be proud of their race and return to Africa. Ah, now being proud of their race was kind of a good thing to do, but return to Africa? Hmm. He said that the Blacks should enjoy the same international recognition as a nation as other peoples after the war. Self-determination should have international recognition. That sounds good, and I must say he had some great ideas, um, but we'll get into that later. The upper class educated Blacks, they viewed him as a dangerous demigod, and when he was convicted for mail fraud, uh, it seemed to demonstrate to the rest of the community that he was no good. But he had followers like you would not believe. He founded Black Star Line, which was a uh, Negro finance business. He founded Negro factories. He tried to get Liberia, Liber Liberia to grant land to settle on and go back to Africa. And he wanted to take over the entire country of Africa. But he was arrested for mail fraud because it was proven that several million dollars had been sent in by supporters and he couldn't account for it. So he's arrested for mail fraud in the selling stock in the Black Star Line. 
He was sent to prison and then deported because the president didn't want him around to be a rallying point. So he moved to London and he moved eventually back to Jamaica in 1940 and died. And like I said, most black leaders, especially the boy, thought he had a very dangerous man, welcomed to deportation, but he had tens of thousands of supporters and he did do some good. That be proud of your race and stand tall was good, but that segregation totally from the white race was pouring kerosene on the fire. But hopes for social changes and the disappointments with the war's aftermath went beyond the black community. In the United States, we learned about the Union of Soviet Social Republics, or the Soviet Union, which was renamed after the revolution. And Lenin, the man who took over, his government nationalized all the land holdings, the banks, and the factories, and he proclaimed a worker's paradise, or a worker's state. And the revolution and <laughs> democratic longings unleashed by World War I sent hope and fear throughout the world. The year 1919, like 1948 and 68, was a year of global social and political unrest. Inspired by Lenin's call for revolution, communist-led governments came to power in Bavaria, which was part of Germany and Hungary. And general strikes demanding wartime promises of industrial democracy shook Belfast and Glasgow and Winnipeg. Anarchist peasants seized land in Spain, and Indian crowds challenged the Brit and I don't mean American Indians, I'm talking about people from India. They challenged the British imperial rule, as did nationalist movements sprang up in other European countries. So opponents to change began to mobilize. And all of the Allied powers who saw the Soviet government as a threat, they even sent an expeditionary force that included American troops to aid Lenin's opponents, which, you know, Wilson said this wasn't happening. He was sending them in there to um, help some of our allies get out. And no, he, they were sent over to help Lenin's opponents, the white Russians. But Wilson's policy toward the Soviet Union showed the contradictions of liberal internationalism. Wilson wanted to foster trade with the new government, but his fear of communism as a source of international instability and a danger to private property led him to the military intervention. They also did not invite the Soviets to peace talks at Versailles, even though they'd been in the war in the beginning. And Wilson refused to recognize the Soviet government at all. And anti-communism remained a basic feature of our entire 20th century U.S. foreign policy. In 1919, we saw enormous turmoil in America. We had racial violence. A devastating flu ep epidemic that killed hundreds of thousands, a bombing campaign targeted the homes of very prominent Americans, and more significant was an upsurge in the later labor movement as workers took Wilson's promise of industrial democracy and freedom seriously. And when it didn't happen, four million workers went on strike. The greatest wave of labor unrest in U.S. history. They faced an unprecedented, unprecedented mobilization of employers, government, and private patriotic organizations. For instance, a strike began in January in Seattle, where a shipyard of workers went on strike, and it became a general strike that paralyzed the city. In September, something unheard of happened. The Boston police went on strike. They didn't go on strike for wages. They were being paid $1,000 a year. And in that, they had to pay for their own uniforms, buy their own guns, their own ammunition. And they figured that the government or their police department should at least furnish the guns and ammunition. But the governor, who was Calvin Coolidge, later to become president, fired the entire police force and called out the National Guard. And then there was a massive coal strike ended only by a federal injunction. In 1919, steel strike was the era's greatest labor revolt. Centered in Chicago, which seems to be the center of a lot of problems, it brought together 365,000 mostly immigrant workers who demanded union recognition, higher wages, and an eight-hour day in an industry that treated workers and suppressed all union activity. And during the war, large numbers of workers had joined the Steel Workers Union, and by the end of 1918, they had won the eight-hour day. But employers resumed opposing the union after the war, and they responded to the strike by appealing to nativism among the native-born workers, many of whom returned to work, and by painting the union and strike as inspired by the IWW communism and disloyalty. Public opinion turned against the strikers, and along with the police attacks, that the strikers defeat in early 1920. An advertisement placed by a steel company in a Pittsburgh newspaper announced, go back to work, the strike has failed. Although many progressives hoped wartime economic planning 
would control, continue to control after 1918, uh, the Wilson administration immediately began to dismantle the agency to control the industrial production and the labor market. Yet the wartime repression of dissent persisted, and it peaked in something called the Red Scare in 1919 to 1920, which was inflamed by the post-war strife by unions, social tensions, and fears created by the Russian Revolution. Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, oh, a little cocky baron, certain the steel strike was part of a global communist conspiracy, ordered federal raids on radical and labor organizations, led by the young director of the Radical Division of the Justice Department, Mr. J. Edgar Hoover. More than 5,000 were arrested, most without warrants, and held for months without charge. Gee, does this sound familiar to any of you? The government deported hundreds of immigrants, radicals, including Emma Goldman, the day you wanted to teach us about birth control. This assault on civil liberties was so extreme that heavy criticism was leveled at Palmer by Congress and the press, and the scared of the Tsar. Although it generated a new concern for civil liberties in the 1920s, the Red Scare successfully destroyed radical groups such as the IWW and the Socialist Party. The first Red Scare is a very, I guess, about a minute long. i uh, tell you a little bit more about it. I remember it only clicked once this time, so we're going to get double. The first act, in, in many, many ways, ways the strangest and, and most terrifying of the entire decade, decade began in the spring of 1919, before, before the troops had even finished coming home. On the evening of May 1st, a night clerk at the main branch of the U.S. Post Office on 33rd Street in Dayton Avenue happened to notice 16 slender, identically wrapped packages, each addressed to a prominent politician or businessman, and each containing enough nitroglycerin to blow a man's head off. Confirming deeply rooted American fears that sinister foreign elements were at work in the land, Revelation helped set in motion the Red Scare, a wave of political reaction and xenophobia unlike anything seen in the country before or since, directed at cities with large populations of immigrants, and especially New York. Within months, Groups that had enjoyed triumphant success only a few years before. Immigrant workers, progressive reformers, and union organizers found themselves on the run. And there are mass roundups. People are taken out, put on Ellis Island, and if they're aliens, uh, they are slated for deportation. And of course, the most famous deportee who was sent off in this period is Emma Goldman. And it's like a fever that grips people. There's another wave in early 1920, and then it breaks. It's like the fever had broken. And it's, I think, then that we really move into the 20s, and we moved into a, a new climate. The communists are going to be driven underground. The labor movement is still there, but it's in serious disarray. You've created a space where both globally, in terms of the competitors in Europe or basket cases, uh, uh, business uh, in the United States and in New York in particular uh, is looking at fabulous possibilities for normalcy, for profit making, for getting on with business. As I said, this is the first Red Scare. It's going to happen again at the end of World War II. Wilson's failure to gain a just peace at the Versailles, and this is a beautiful, beautiful castle in France. Seems like most of our peace treaties are at Versailles, where they're signed. That's why they're called Versailles treaties. His failure to gain the peace at Versailles, based on these 14 points, kind of exacerbated many progressive sense that the war would not fundamentally transform society and the government. In late 1918, Wilson traveled to Europe for the Versailles Peace Conference, and here, this is, this is what was so bad about it. We've never had a sitting president go to a peace conference of any kind, and he is a Democrat. Yes, he has some extremely good, intelligent Republicans in the Senate who should have picked, he didn't pick one, wait, I take that back, he picked one Republican who was a yes man. The rest of them, the total Democratic convention took with him. All of them in yes man, because Wilson didn't like criticism. So, of course, by the time he got there, the Senate and the Congress is totally upset with him. But he traveled to France and was welcomed by ordinary Europeans as a hero. He's going to lead the peace conference himself. 
This is a picture of the crown. They called him Wilson the Just. Viva la Wilson. So while his 14 points had called for open diplomacy, the Versailles talks were held in secret. The Versailles Treaty did accomplish some of Wilson's hopes, including the establishment of something called the League of Nations. But there were 27 nations there, the big four, France, England, and U.S., and, well, it should have been Russia. France, England, Wilson. Hmm. What they were going to do was punish Germany and make her take full responsibility, take away the land that she had gained, and pay huge war reparations. He did get the League of Nations to supervise a new international order. But Article 10 was at the heart of the plan. And it applied to uh, all members were obligated to look after all the other members over their independence and territorial integrity. But he definitely wanted to get self-determination for the Eastern Europe. He wanted to make new nations from the ruins of the defeated Austria-Hungary Empire and Germany. But basically, this conference and this treaty was nothing more than an effort to seek revenge and guarantee future conflict. He was not happy with what he could get. And other people there, I think I have, I don't have it listed, uh, everybody wanted something. France won the right to occupy the iron and coal rich regions of Germany. Strict limits were placed on Germany's future army, which was limited to Navy and was required to make reparations so high that it devastated the German economy. So the war damaged Europeans' claim to be a higher civilization with the right to rule lesser peoples and elevate the international prestige of the United States was supposedly put to test. Was Wilson's language of self-determination inspired by anarchy groups and colonial people across the world? But they took this rhetoric more seriously than he did. Because Wilson's idea of an equality of nations clashed with Europeans rulers' wishes to rebuild their empires in this post-war period. They rejected the appeals of colonial figures for independence, such as Nguyen Van Tong, the future Ho Chi Minh, who went to Versailles to ask for freedom from the French colonial rule. The British and French had no intention of applying self-determination to their colonies. The Ottoman Empire was divided into nations such as Syria and Iraq and Palestine, over which the British and French were given mandates to govern. Former German colonies in Africa were given to South America, Australia, and Japan and Ireland was not given its independence. The map of Europe was redrawn totally by the victors. New countries of Estonia, Austria-Hungary was divided, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia became Yugoslavia, part of Danzig went to Poland, Alsace-Lorraine went back to France. Now this is a map of Europe, as you can see, this is the old here, German, Austrian, Hungary, this is all theirs. Now on the next map you're going to see look what happens. You got all these new countries created. Germany is cut practically in half. And through here, also in Lorraine, this is where you're going to have problems between Germany and France later on. But look, all this is created. Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, uh, this is eventually going to be broken up later on, but right now, we had the audacity to think that we could, and some of these people, you know, especially in this area here, they were, they were German-speaking people. And this is what Hitler's going to use in a few years to try to get them to come back into the German Empire. We want to reunite our German-speaking peoples. Austria-Hungary is now going to be two countries and very, very small. It's, like I said, it was guaranteed future conflict, especially by making Germany accept total responsibility for it. Wilson's disappointment among the colonial peoples that the 14 points had not been applied to the non-European world created cynicism regarding the West's language of freedom and democracy. His apparent capitulation to the claims of the European Empire sparked popular anti-Western nationalist movements across the world, including the May 4th movement in China and the communist movement in Vietnam led by Ho Chi Minh. Lenin, in fact, spoke of the right of nations to self-determination before Wilson. Lenin's reputation supplanted that of the American president. 
These movements, whether or not they were communist, signaled the emergence of an anti-colonial nationalism as a major force in the 20th century. Ironically, when colonial peoples demanded to be recognized as independent members of the international community, they kind of invoked the legacy of the American Revolution as the first colonial struggle to establish an independent nation. And Wilson's language of self-governing and equal nation states became a very legitimate form of a government and world order. So Wilson came back to the United States from Versailles with his treaty in hand, seeing the League of Nations as the war's most important legacy. But like I say, many Americans feared that League membership would force the United States into open-ended commitments in the affairs of other nations. And this is not what he really wanted. We also didn't want the other countries to be able to come and say we had a new civil war. We didn't want France to be able to come over here and set us down and talk to us. And that, that's our business. You stay out of our affairs, we'll stay out of yours. Now, Wilson argued that the United States could not save the world without being continually involved. His opponents, led by Massachusetts Republican Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, argued that the League would limit America's freedom of action. Wilson refused to compromise. Lodge refused to compromise. And in the midst of this League debate, Wilson had gone on a train trip to try to drum up popular support. Wilson had a massive stroke that left him incapacitated. It's during this time that they say his wife Edith was running the country it's because she was so overly protective, she wouldn't let anybody in the scene. I mean, if you talk to him, you had to go through her, and what he said to the, back to the members of the Senate had to come back through her. So they say that she effectively assumed his office for the 17 months left of his term. And the Senate was so stalemated, and with Lodge leading them, they refused to compromise and refused to sign the treaty. So no treaty ending the war for us was ever signed during Wilson's term of president. In the immediate aftermath, aftermath, the United States retreated from international affairs, and over the long term, Wilson's idealism and power politics shaped the fundamentals of American foreign policy into the 20th century. And Warren G. Harding ran for and was elected president in 1920, and his platform was the end of Wilsonianism and return to normalcy. Now, we will learn more about Mr. Warren G. Harding in our next chapter. But I want to introduce you to him through this brief video about him. He was, we'll learn more about his private life than his politics. We'll get to the politics at the end of the next, next chapter. But for the next two decades of the 20th century, come to, so the first two decades of the 20th century come to close. The next, the decades of the roaring 20s. So let's go back and meet President Hardy. Come on. Why won't it come out? I don't know why it's not coming up. I will, since it won't come up, I will see what's wrong and put it in an addendum at the end of the, uh, I'll put it in the uh, content section for you to see because it's only about four minutes long and I think you'll enjoy it. But for a few minutes, um, these are some important questions you should be able to answer after we finish both sections of the chapter. What were the four main reasons for the powder keg in Europe? Remember M-A-I-N? What is credited with the cause of the start of the war? Uh, somebody getting killed, remember? What was the Red Scare? The causes. Was it justified? And do you think we remained neutral during the beginning of the war before we were involved? Do you think anything was not neutral? What? And why was President Wilson unable to get that treaty ratified? Who was against it and who was for it? Now, I didn't go into the policy of the submarine warfare in the Sussex uh, Agreement. It explains it very well in your text. And be able to explain trench warfare, which we saw as a little brief video at the end last time. So, I apologize for <laughs> the problems I've had on this particular tape. Uh, apparently, this is one of those days. It's not Friday the 13th, but it seems like it today. So. I apologize. I hope I have not been too confusing to you. And we have effectively ended this section. Thank you again for.